And joining us now is Janice Stein, TVO's own international affairs analyst. Welcome back to the studio, Janice. Terrific to be back, Steve. You're honestly going to Afghanistan? I really am. Are you out of your mind? Well, you know what the real problem is here? It's going to be 45 degrees in the shade. Now, that is warm, let me tell you. That will be something. Let me start, but I want to read you a little piece from something that was in the Toronto Star a few days ago about NGOs. As an NGO, our security and the success of our activities depend on our acceptance in the local community, on our independence, and on an impartial delivery of assistance. These values date back to the Crimean War when the Swiss businessman and social activist Henri Dunant developed them as basic humanitarian principles to which all humanitarian organizations must adhere and which help provide security in conflict. Despite the historic importance of these principles, governments and the military continue to question and criticize the approach as they favor short-term solutions to long-term problems. Earlier this month in the Toronto Star, and I, I raised this with you because I know you're on the board of Care Canada. I am. For a long time, actually, right? Years and years and years. And I know that your uh, fellow board member, John Manley, is going on this trip with yes, you as well. Yes, we're going together. Okay, so NGOs are a bit on the hot seat over there in Afghanistan right now. Bring well, us up to date. Well, they really are, um, in part because the paragraph that you just read, Steve, actually describes the world in which NGOs live. I'm not sure how good a description it is going forward. NGOs can't work if there's no security on the ground. So despite the insistence on independence, you actually need a security envelope, and that's really provided by the military. There is actually quite a discussion going on between the military in Canada and NGOs about clearing some space for them to do what they do best on the ground. I think you're going to see also um, quite a signal coming out of the Prime Minister's office uh, in the near-term future that CETA has to do a lot more funding of NGOs, of Canadian NGOs, who actually can deliver programs very effectively. How is CARE doing over there right now? CARE has been there for years and years and years, one of the few NGOs, Steve, that did not leave during the Taliban years. So even during those years from really 92 uh, on, uh, and then from 96 when they took power in Kabul, uh, CARE continued to fund a widows and orphans program. Now if you actually think about a society like Afghanistan, 40% of the women are widowed because of the terrible fighting that's been going on uh, for more than three decades. So we stayed, we were on the ground throughout that whole period, and we're now about to start something new, and that's partly why John and I are going. Uh, CARE really believes that uh, the best thing we can do is help people to create jobs. Uh, making the, markets work for the poor. Making markets work for so the poor. So is this about microloans, or what, what is this no, about? It's no, it's not about microloans. Actually, CETA has done a great job um, in microfinance in Afghanistan. Um, there are about 40,000 women now who've had these loans, between three and $500 a piece. Repayment rate, 98%. Hmm. But at the level above that, between these very small loans and the big, big, big enterprises, huge gap. So, if you're starting a business, Steve, a hockey business, <laughs> uh, marketing really great books about hockey, for example, and you need $20,000 to get started, there's no credit. You can't access that kind of thing. So what CARE wants to do is to, in effect, invest. Uh, it's the movement away from charity, beyond philanthropy, to social investment. Invest and allow people to use their natural skills, and they're very real in Afghanistan, to create mid-level enterprises. Okay, to that end, let me read you another quote, this time from a guy named Jason Burke out of the New Statesman of a couple of months ago. We're not going to liberate women in Afghanistan for a generation or so, because trying to do so will play into the insurgents' hands. Every rash attempt to reform the ultra-conservative Afghan rural population in the past 100 years has sparked violence. Nor are we going to eradicate heroin. We are not going to stabilize the South rapidly either. Now, I know how important women's rights, particularly in Afghanistan, has been to you as a right. personal crusade. Do you agree with his rather bleak prescription or look at things, rather? I think he makes a really good point, Steve, because he's talking about the South, um, which is where we're going. The North, which includes Kabul, there has been huge progress, uh, huge progress. Even in the South, though, now, girls are in school. They were not in school. Now, they're in separate classrooms, sometimes in separate schools. They weren't in school at all under the Taliban. 
So if you say liberate women and women have rights in the way that you and I might talk about women's rights in Canada, I agree with him. That is a very long, slow process. But a mother being able to take her daughter to a clinic uh, and have a female doctor examine a female child in the South, that is now becoming possible. Infant mortality has dropped in Afghanistan for the first time because women are back at work working in clinics as doctors and as nurses. A really great success story because we hear a lot of the bleak news. Uh, one of the things that CETA helped fund in Afghanistan is village councils. There are now 16,000 of them operating across Afghanistan. In the south, there's a woman's council and a man's council. In most of the north, they're integrated. But women still have a voice in the south now, even in the most conservative provinces that they didn't have before. It's interesting that you tell us about the success stories of CETA over there, because we just had Senator Peter Stollery in that chair not too long ago. Right. And his committee you know, concluded that CETA was a disaster and might need to be blown up and started all over again. Um, it's not as bleak as all not that. Not all that bad. No, there really are some severe, there are some really big problems, there's no question about it. Uh, and when we come back, uh, we will be talking to CETA about what we see. Um, I'm quite critical of some of the programming, but I think it's important to recognize the successes that are real. Um, the support of what's called the National Solidarity Program, these village councils, is terrific. Does CETA have to do better funding some of our own NGOs on the ground? It does, but it's aware of it. Uh, and I think we'll see some movement. It's a, I think the fundamental point that you made, Steve, is right. This is a long struggle. Um, our former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Peter Harder, said, this is a test of our strategic patience. How patient are we? If we're there to go in, stay two years, and leave, we shouldn't be there at all. I'm going to come back to more on that in a second, but before, I, I do want to ask you about Chris Alexander, our former ambassador, yes. who's now there representing the UN. Yes, You're he is. You're going to meet with him? Yes, I what am. What are you going to talk about? Well, he's been in Afghanistan such a long time. He was our ambassador, then he went to New York. He's the Secretary General's Deputy Special Representative. Uh, Chris um, was in, in Toronto just a few months ago, and he was cautiously optimistic. He sees some progress. Uh, he understands how important stabilizing the South is. You can't just work in Kabul. If you go to Kabul alone, you're not going to understand Afghanistan. The South really matters here. And you're here. going to go to the South. We are going to go to the South in the 45 degree heat, probably in a Canadian military helicopter that does evasive maneuvers. So when I come back green, you'll understand why <laughs> I'm not the most courageous flyer. Um, but so Chris is looking in detail at what's working on the ground, what's not working on the ground. Can you stabilize the South without Pakistan, though? That's the big one that everyone is talking about. Um, I have a slightly different view on that. A lot of people are very critical of, of Pakistan. Bob Ray was there just four months ago, um, essentially argued that Pakistan is a big part of the problem. I have a little different view because the Pashtuns in the South, who are by far the majority, they're actually one community living on both sides of the border. There are tribal networks and family networks. Between 10 and 20,000 people cross the, the border uh, checkpoints, so-called checkpoints, mm -hmm. in any given day. The answer really is not in saying to the Pakistani president, you have to do more, because there's not a lot more he can do. It's about the same kinds of issues. It's about creating some employment opportunities um, on the Pakistani side of the border. It's about strengthening communities. We've gone through a really interesting period. Some of the Pashtun in Pakistan on the tribal areas recently took on the Uzbeks who have been there um, for a year or so, took them on. There was considerable community fighting and said, we don't want um, foreign militants in our community anymore. We have to see the Pashtun South as including Pakistan and try to develop shared programs. There was a bit of a debate in Parliament a couple of months ago about whether or not this country ought to be talking to the Taliban. What's yes. your view on that? Absolutely. Should be. We certainly should be. Um, when we say the Taliban, as if there is one Taliban right now, there actually isn't. There's Osama bin Laden and, and his lieutenants who are somewhere in the mountains. Nobody's seen them, no sightings recently. Mm. 
there are a group of Taliban who meet in a council, walk the streets openly in Quetta in Pakistan, and actually hold press conferences. <laughs> uh, and then there are local Taliban leaders uh, in the south of Afghanistan. President Karzai is already talking to those. There is already negotiations. In fact, uh, the, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, ISI, is mediating those negotiations. Uh, it's the purpose of the negotiations. Those who want to come into government, who are willing, in a sense, to say we're going to give governing a chance rather than an insurgency, uh, we have to make space for those. Gotcha. I want to ask you about the detainee situation, of right. course, which has been so prevalent in the news uh, as of late. And I'll start by reading something that James Travers had in the Star uh, just yesterday. With rights groups, the media, and the world fully alert to current jail conditions and past abuses, there is no margin for error and plenty of room for more political embarrassment. That increases pressure on the military to consider prisoners as more than a nuisance and on the Kabul administration to demonstrate that it accepts Western judicial values and deserves continued international support. Generally speaking, Janice, how's this country done on that issue, cleaning up that issue? Could we have been faster on this? Yes. Um, could we have argued for a better agreement originally at the time? Yes. That agreement, as you know, Steve, was concluded during the Canadian federal election campaign, the original agreement, um, with the Minister of Defense campaigning in his constituency uh, during that period. That's not an ideal so time. Understandable that some stuff fell through the cracks. Well, though. let's put it this way. It certainly is not an ideal time to conclude an agreement. We shouldn't have any monitoring. Mm. But now we've got the toughest agreement of any country in NATO. The Canadian agreement is the toughest. Do you think that that's going to end the abuse that goes on in Afghan jails overnight? I don't think so. Uh, I think what comes out of this uh, is an Afghan awareness at some levels, how important this is to Canada. So if we're talking about a longer term relationship where gradually they come to understand what's important to us just as we come to understand what's important to them, we move the ball a little in these last several months. Is it going to be adequate? Are we going to have to go back at it? Uh, we are. You know, the big surprise to me, why wouldn't NATO take this on? Well, because they don't want to. That's right, because they don't want the political embarrassment that the Canadian government just suffered. But the, there is an alliance. Uh, there's no reason why NATO couldn't, in fact, uh, construct and run a prison. The problem has come. And, but the argument you get back, and you'll get this from Afghan ministers, we are a sovereign country. We've had a democratic election. Um, it is perfectly normal that you hand over detainees to us. It's we who have to improve our standards. Just on the issue of NATO, you know, obviously this country has criticized many of the NATO countries yes. for not pulling their weight over right. there and doing a lot of the duty in some of the softer areas where the Canadian troops are really into the heavy lifting right. over there. Do you think those kinds of pressures will, um, you know, can they really affect NATO's future oh, yeah. existence? Oh, yeah. They can. Oh, yeah. There's no question because um, for this book that I'm finishing, uh, I've done uh, a fair bit of interviewing in NATO headquarters in Brussels. It's really interesting. They understand the, the NATO bureaucracy, the NATO military commanders understand this is the test for NATO. Think about it this way. NATO has never fought. NATO has never fought? Fought. What about uh, Kosovo? Kosovo yeah. That's right. But in, in terms of a full-out major commitment, this is NATO's biggest challenge. They never had it during the Cold War. And boy, the cracks are showing um, among Alliance members. There are many in Brussels who say it is not only the future of Afghanistan that's at stake here, it's the future of NATO. Hmm. Any reason to expect that uh, with Nicolas Sarkozy now in charge in France, that uh, France might change its attitude to this? Well, certainly. You know, if you listen to Sarkozy the candidate versus mm -hmm. Sarkozy the president, um, very, very different from its predecessor. Uh, much more committed to um, France pulling its weight in this kind of operation. But let's wait and see. It's been a very long time since France was out front defending NATO. Steve, I'm not holding my breath here. Not holding your breath. One more thing on the detainees thing. Uh, Rick Hillier, our chief yeah. of defense staff, the critics have really been out for him lately because he signed that agreement. Yes, he did. Um, 
on you know, prisoner it's quite exchange. Un, just think about it, quite unusual. When can you actually think of a situation when a CDS signed an agreement? Well, it's you know, his... Ministers <clears throat> his yeah, but his explanation was that he was asked as a kind of a Absolutely. diplomatic his, protocol thing to participate, so he did. And his own so minister was campaigning. Right. So, so, he, so he did it. That's a good explanation, absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. That's the way it happens. That's the way it happens. Well, is he therefore, with his signature on that paper, responsible for protecting the detainees that Canada captures? You know, it's interesting. Let me, let me fill in the background when it was signed for just a minute. What was the issue they were really worrying about at the time? They were, we were, Canada, we were handing over detainees to the United States. They were spending a little time in Afghanistan and some were going to Guantanamo Bay. He, the minister and the chief of the defense staff, that's what they were preoccupied with. We can't do this. We can't hand over detainees that are going to find themselves in Guantanamo Bay. They were focused on solving that problem. They weren't paying enough attention to what happens to prisoners once we hand them over to a sovereign government, Afghanistan. That was the gap. We've moved to fill that gap. Is the problem gone away? No. Not when you have security guards in Afghanistan and a police force in Afghanistan, the majority of whom are illiterate can't read and write. Think of that as the development challenge. Let's take one more minute here before we go across the studio to continue our discussion and talk about when the troops, this country's troops, ought to come home. Uh, one more uh, graphic here. Here's Ipsos read from last month. Despite recent troop fatalities, majority of Canadians, 52%, support the role of Canada's troops in Afghanistan. However, two-thirds, 63%, want Canada's troops to come home on schedule by February 2009. Do you think Canada ought to be in Afghanistan past 2009? That's really the big one. Um, we've got a really tough problem here because in order for us to leave, Steve, we need a replacement nation. Um, and they're not lining up, are they? Not only are they not lining up, they're heading for the exit doors. Yeah. It's going to be very difficult to find a replacement nation. So I think Canada's going to be in a really tough spot, bluntly speaking. We're going to have to say we're leaving come hell or high water, we're gone, to in fact leave a hole in Kandahar province would probably discourage the Dutch next door in Oriskan. Uh, our decision could be the hinge decision, the really critical decision for the whole operation. We're going to be under a great deal of pressure not to leave until there's a replacement for us. Okay. I would ask uh, everybody watching this program that if you have questions uh, for Janice Stein as she embarks on her trip to Afghanistan, please send them in to me at my blog, tvo.org. And Janice, when you get back, uh, we will put the viewers' questions to you. I'll try to email you from there if we get enough power hey, and electricity. That'd be very I will cool. I'll do my best. That'd be very cool. Okay. In the meantime, join me across the other side of the studio and we'll continue our discussion. We're going to talk Turkey and democracy and secularism in the Muslim world. Let's go.